The Harry Brown Permanent Portfolio is a simple, straightforward portfolio consisting of four equally weighted assets. Here we'll look at its components, historical performance, and the best ETFs to use in its implementation. What is the Permanent Portfolio? The Permanent Portfolio is a simple four-slice portfolio created by investment advisor Harry Brown in the 1980s and presented in his book Fail Safe Investing in 2001. It looks like this, 25% total US stock market, 25% long-term bonds, 25% cash, and 25% gold. Not unlike the all-weather portfolio, the permanent portfolio was designed to be a simple, diversified portfolio that could perform well in all economic conditions. Brown called it the permanent portfolio because, in his words, once you set it up, you never need to rearrange the investment mix, even if your outlook for the future changes. Having only four assets at equal weights, it is easily accessible and understandable. Those four assets expected behavior correspond to four economic climates as follows. Stocks for economic expansion, bonds for deflation, cash for economic recession, and gold for inflation. I concede that Harry Brown's permanent portfolio is indeed simple and diversified, and the concept sounds nice on paper, but I have a few problems with it. First, there's a relatively low allocation to stocks. We know that equities are usually the primary driver of a portfolio's returns. At just 25%, the permanent portfolio doesn't give enough room for stocks to shine, especially for the young investor with a long time horizon and a high tolerance for risk. Secondly, 25% of the portfolio is in cash, which just means treasury bills. I'll be the first to admit that cash is an oft overlooked investment, but giving it one quarter of the portfolio creates a significant opportunity cost in my opinion, especially when considering economic depressions are the least likely environment of the four aforementioned economic climates, and young investors with a long horizon probably shouldn't be holding any cash. As as such, I would think it's intuitive to lower the allocation to cash, creating room for more stocks and or more bonds. In fairness, cash is a decent inflation hedge. Thirdly, there are no international holdings. International stocks and bonds have just fairly recently become accepted diversification boosting holdings in the last 25 years or so. Prior to that, they weren't popular among institutional investors, so it makes sense that Brown didn't include any when he designed the permanent portfolio in the 1980s. Ideally, I'd I'd probably like to see at least an 80-20 split for both stocks and bonds between the US and ex-US assets. Similarly, 25% to gold is much too high for my tastes. If you've read any of my blog posts or watched any other videos of mine about portfolios that use gold, you know I'm not a big fan of the shiny metal. It has a non-negative correlation to stocks, albeit low or small, is much more volatile than bonds, is not a value-producing asset, i.e. it has a real expected return of zero and has not been a reliable inflation hedge historically. While it has offered protection in some inflationary periods in the past, we can't reliably predict how gold will behave in the future. I suspect the large emphasis on gold may be due at least partially to Harry Brown's being the Libertarian Party presidential nominee in both 1996 and 2000. The Libertarian Party platform has a historical distrust of US monetary policy by the Federal Reserve and a suggestion of returning to the gold standard, wherein money is based on a fixed amount of physical gold. Speaking of US monetary policy, your excitement or lack thereof over gold likely also depends on your view of it. I'm personally of the mind that monetary policy in the US is a fundamentally different beast post Volcker after 1982, allowing us to hopefully avoid a runaway inflationary environment like we saw in the late 1970s when bonds suffered and gold did well. In my opinion, similar to my point about the cash position earlier, in a long long-term investment portfolio with an investment horizon of 20 plus years, holding gold only creates an opportunity cost where you could have held something else in its place. That said, I'll concede that it may offer a short-term diversification benefit due to its usual uncorrelation to both stocks and bonds, making for a lower risk profile and safer withdrawal rates in retirement. So adopting the permanent portfolio may very well be a prudent move at or near retirement, or for a risk-averse investor who wants to cover all bases for all environments to minimize volatility and risk. But even then, I'd probably suggest the all-weather portfolio or the golden butterfly portfolio for that prescription. We can explore some comparisons of these in a bit. Because of all this, generally speaking, Brown's naive equal weighting of these assets doesn't make much sense intuitively and is almost certainly suboptimal in my opinion. This becomes even more obvious when we consider the fact that the four aforementioned environments do not have the same probability of occurrence. Severe protracted 
protracted deflation, for example, is extremely unlikely. Brown makes the mistake I see far too often of viewing each asset in isolation instead of looking at the portfolio holistically. As we would expect, compared to something simpler and more traditional, like a 60-40 stocks bonds portfolio, the permanent portfolio tends to look attractive during bear markets and unattractive during bull markets, evidenced by the mutual funds capital inflows and outflows during those respective periods. Now let's look at the performance of the permanent portfolio versus the S&P 500. Going back to 1978, we can compare the permanent portfolio to the S&P 500 index through July 2021. As we'd expect, the permanent portfolio does a pretty good job of mitigating volatility and drawdowns, providing a much smoother ride than the S&P 500. Its volatility was less than half that of the S&P 500, and its max drawdown during the global financial crisis of 2008 was roughly one quarter that of the S&P 500. But notice how the risk-adjusted return, in this case measured by Sharp, is nearly the same for these two very different portfolios. Basically, the permanent portfolio has still delivered a pretty low return given its risk profile. That's why I said I'd be more likely to use the Golden Butterfly portfolio or Ray Dalio's All Weather portfolio. I'll show those comparisons in the next sections. The Golden Butterfly portfolio simply takes those same assets in the permanent portfolio and specifically adds small cap value, a move that I'm a fan of. This invariably makes it comparatively more aggressive than the permanent portfolio, but we're still talking about a relatively low volatility all season strategy. In taking up a larger stocks position, we're also tilting toward an expansionary economic environment. I'm okay with this. The economy grows more than it declines. Your adoption thereof may depend on your economic outlook. We're also simultaneously decreasing the allocations to cash and gold, which should also bode well for higher returns over the long term. Here's a back test from 1978 through July 2021, comparing the permanent portfolio and the golden butterfly portfolio. As we'd expect, going back to 1978, we see greater general and risk-adjusted returns for the golden butterfly, with slightly more volatility and a larger drawdown. This is due again to its inclusion of small cap value stocks. Looking at the sharp ratios, a measure of risk-adjusted return, we can see that we were better compensated per unit of risk by going with the golden butterfly. I definitely take the golden butterfly over the permanent portfolio. Again, I like small cap value stocks, and I don't want the permanent portfolio's extra 5% in gold. To be fair to Harry Brown, we didn't even know about the size and value factors and the glamour of small cap value stocks when he designed this thing in the 1980s. And even if we did, there weren't really any products available with which to invest in them. Compared to Ray Dalio's all-weather portfolio, we're talking about more gold, more cash, less stocks, and less treasuries than the permanent portfolio. Like the permanent portfolio, the all-weather portfolio is designed to weather any storm by utilizing diversification across assets. Interestingly, like Brown, Dalio also chooses to be market agnostic with the all-weather portfolio, admitting that we don't know what the future will hold, yet the allocations therein are obviously very different. With data for commodities funds only going back to 2002, here's what the comparison looks like through July 2021. While the permanent portfolio is very simple and easy to understand with its equal weighting of four assets, that's also its downfall in my opinion. I'm of the mind that we can much more effectively deliver on the permanent portfolio's goal of de-risking the portfolio using different allocations, especially given our most recent understanding of asset pricing and how we might weight those assets more efficiently in diversified portfolios. If you do want to invest in the permanent portfolio, I think a broker like M1 Finance is a great fit thanks to its zero transaction fees, intuitive pie interface, dynamic rebalance, for new deposits and one-click manual rebalancing, as you would want to rebalance the permanent portfolio regularly. I'll provide a link to my comprehensive review of the platform. Utilizing mostly low-cost Vanguard funds, we can construct the permanent portfolio with the following ETFs. VTI at 25%, VGLT at 25%, VGSH at 25%, and SGOL at 25%. As I noted earlier, the permanent portfolio doesn't have any international exposure. As I've noted elsewhere, it's probably a good idea to diversify geographically in stocks. Taking the stocks global simply requires replacing VTI, Vanguard's total U.S. stock market, 
with VT, Vanguard's total world stock market fund. The portfolio then looks like this, VT at 25%, VGLT again at 25%, VGSH at 25%, and SGOL at 25%. In conclusion, the permanent portfolio is basically a good introductory lesson on asset class diversification in my opinion, and props to Harry Brown for making the concept more mainstream. The permanent portfolio does a pretty good job of mitigating volatility and drawdowns, but in practice I'd be more likely to use the all-weather portfolio or the golden butterfly portfolio to achieve that goal. They seem demonstrably superior, as the permanent portfolio's simplicity is ironically also its weakness in my opinion. If all this multi-fund stuff still seems daunting, there's a permanent portfolio mutual fund for which the ticker is PRPFX, but it's pretty pricey at 0.83%. You'd come out far cheaper just using the funds I've listed here and doing it yourself. What do you think of the permanent portfolio? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching.